Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight to see John Hawley's program on Guardians of the Manitou Passage. I'm Tim Foster. I'm the board. I'm on the board of directors at the Benzie Area History Museum, and I'm representing the museum tonight. And thanks to everybody from the museum for coming out and supporting John and his program and the museum. We have an assortment of books back there, which I saw some of you looking at, um, and some other memorabilia back there. <clears throat> A few words about John. And I'm sure most of you know John already, uh, but this is a refresher course here on John Hawley. Dr. John, <laughs> Dr. Jonathan P. Hawley, a resident of Frankfurt, Michigan for 20 years, along with his wife, artist Peggy Hawley, earned his PhD in political science at the University of Missouri, Columbia. His career included university teaching, 10 years staff service in the U.S. House of Representatives, during which he worked towards the establishment of Michigan's Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, and nearly two decades of corporate public affairs consulting. Upon moving to Frankfurt, John became a founding board member of the Friends of Point Betsy, which we are truly grateful just for that alone. Um, serving a uh, lighthouse serving through his tenure tenure as vice president and president during the historic light stations restoration and the construction of its museum a retired member of the board of grand traverse regional community foundation he serves on the board of frankfurt's benzie shores district library and is a fellow rotarian along with uh, some of us else, some uh, other people here John is the author of Point Betsy, Light Keeping and Life Saving on Northeastern Lake Michigan, and From Artisans to Artists, Betsy Bay's Historic Island Story. And on a personal note, uh, John and I do share a couple of things in common. We were both born in the same hospital in Evanston, Illinois, although spread a little bit far apart there. <laughs> We were both born in Evanston in different parts of the town. Uh, we've both spent at least part of every year of our life here at Crystal Lake. Uh, we both relocated here to Frankfurt to spend our so-called golden years. And we are also both long suffering Cub fans, except for 2016. And it looks like this year is going to be another long suffering season. So with no more delay, here's Dr. John Hawley. Thanks, Tim, very much for that introduction. <clears throat> Guardians of Manitou Passage. You probably saw the book at the back table, but I wanted to call attention uh, to the subtitle, which often says more than the real title does. I guess this does describe it, a chronicle of service to Lake Michigan Mariners from 1840 to 1915. Um, it truly is a chronicle. It spans the entire history and, and prior days that led up to the establishment of the United States Life Saving Service, which came to its end in 1915 with the uh, creation of the Coast Guard into which this function was transferred. But I first want to thank the Society for inviting me to discuss the book and to Barbara Mort for endorsing it so beautifully. The book primarily chronicles the talents, dedication, and sacrifices of the rescue crews serving Lake Michigan Mariners during 17 decades of sail and early steam powered ships. And uh, I'm going to begin with a quick run through of about 30 historical images. Uh, several of them are maps at the beginning and uh, others uh, which will show the places, people and services of which I will speak and in the course of it, clarify their significance. If I do this right. I know there's a delay. Do 
whether it's done right or wrong. No one? That's pretty simple. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, this is a map uh, from the Michigan Territory preceding statehood, uh, 1822. Gives you a pretty good look at uh, Lake Michigan. And uh, you can easily see the Mackinac Straits area. Uh, you can see Grand Traverse Bay as a big landmark. Uh, you can see uh, it says Manitou Isle and it says Sleeping Bear Point is uh, interesting there. And then Gravelly Point, uh, which I take uh, to be Point Betsy and then uh, all the way down uh, the lake shore. It was hopeful. But we missed a couple maps there somehow. Let me go back, see if I can make it back up. Yeah, that's all. Uh, I'm just saying that in case I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, there it goes. Okay. Uh, this is uh, 1844 map. Uh, things getting a little bit clearer here in it. I I think it's. I actually have a copy of the map lying here on the stage. So afterward, if you want to see the real thing, you can. Um, <laughs> this is uh, precedes, of course, the establishment of Benzie. So it's all Leelanau County up in there. Uh, and you see the term sleeping bear bite. Uh, you don't see that too often as opposed to bay. Uh, and but, but Point Betsy, one of the interesting things to me about this map is that uh, Point Betsy is, has the aw French and the Betsy S-I-E as opposed to the more conventional French spelling. And this really didn't take popular hold until close to the 1900s. So it's kind of interesting that it appears on this. But this is to me one of the most fascinating maps that I've seen, literally of the uh, Manitou Islands. It is um, done by a French uh, cartographer. Uh, they did um, something like 19,000 maps he and a colleague for, and they were published in 19 volumes. And I just found it fascinating. Uh, this is uh, 1892. And I just found it fascinating that there was that much interest and focus on the Manitou Passage. And the depictions that you have here show the depths uh, and the wider and the lighter, the colors reveal the shallower and shallower of the water. And that's a pretty good uh, rationale for why we're here and why the book exists and so forth, because those were the areas of trouble. It's a 1912 map, uh, it's a little hard to read. Uh, this is the US government map, but you get a pretty good look at the Manitous and the, see what, the, the uh, course coming down. It's the North Manitou Island, a shot. Um, with the uh, life saving station. Um, a typical surfing boat and crew in their cork vests. And I wanted to call attention to the length of those oars and the weight that uh, <laughs> they uh, carried. And to tell you before I forget, that if you, one of these days, if you have not noticed these in the Point Betsy Museum, over the garage doors, that's the west side of the new building at Point Betsy, new in the last several years, uh, are mounted an actual set of surfman's oars from Point Betsy Life Saving Station. And people, I think, miss seeing it, but that was the only place where we could actually put them in and to think about what it would have been like to uh, row these oars 
uh, is uh, quite prospect. Some of you have seen this picture before, the life-saving crew drilling a rollover situation in front of the old hotel in Frankfurt. This is the life-saving crew on North Manitou Island, all in its harness. You'll hear more about this and uh, how they did their thing. Literally harnessed to pull the beach cart to a wreck site. Uh, this is at uh, Sleeping Bear Point um, in uh, Glen Haven. I'll have more to say about that. North Manitou uh, was actually, this picture was taken after the Coast Guard took over, but same structure. There's the boat, house, boat uh, area itself. This again is Sleeping Bear Point. The station at Sleeping Bear Point was moved once in history from its original location uh, eastward to a better site. See. Okay. This I have in here, A, because of the obvious enjoyment of the people aboard, but also to make a point. I have come across an endless number of boats bearing the name Manitou. I talk in the early part of the book about why, but in fact, its name applies to a massive array of commercial enterprises and so forth, and goes back to uh, the Native American heritage. But among the ships that is uh, named Manitou, and you would see this in the book, but I don't have it up here. There's a great picture of President Kennedy at the helm of uh, Manitou, which was the boat that the Coast Guard prepared for him as president to be able to sail. You know, he was a big sailing enthusiast. Manitou was built by Chicagoans uh, to race in the Mackinac race. It won it in the first two years. Ultimately, it's through a long story, it became in the possession of the Coast Guard. It's used it for a while. And when JFK was elected and they started to think, well, what, how are we going to get a boat for him? They said, we have the perfect one. And so they outfitted it for presidential use. And uh, that gave a great uh, stature to it. Uh, typical uh, steamer wreck site uh, in the passage. South Manitou Island, Lighthouse. In the later years in my story, a uh, typical passenger boat in the harbor. U.S. Life Saving Service did have boats, not only just surfman's boats and ultimately power boats, but a sailing boat, which in this case would have been used to go back and forth between the island and the mainland. Typical one of the latter uh, schooners on the lake. This is North Manitou Island, lighthouse. There again with its foghorn next to it. Uh, later in North Manitou Station's history, the structures were replaced by a light ship. Uh, actually, over a period of time, three of them. And of course, they would bear the name Manitou. Uh, there's another cruise picture, all in their cork vests, ready to roll down the ramp and into the lake. At the keeper. That's the first uh, schoolhouse on North Manitou. There's the North Manitou crew, also ready to go. The mail must go through. Those fellows, re people residing out on the Manitous year round, uh, you know, face the possibility of being cut off in the wintertime for substantial periods. But here they are, the crews working around to get a boat loose to get to shore. This is one of my favorite pictures. I think probably the light keeper and his dog out fishing off the uh, this is one of the nice ads of the, from when uh, the the uh, crew the cruise is a business from Chicago and 
to Mackinac, Charlevoix, Petoskey, et cetera, uh, was uh, being undertaken. North Manitou, uh, you know, in the course of the Whitting operation, look at the size of those logs. Another wreck. And these are a couple of things that I took uh, from Point Betsy's museum. This is equipment that I'm going to refer to. Uh, and the, uh, the gun, the Lyle gun that fired the projectile to make possible rescues from ships stranded offshore, the line that that would fire, the beach cart that would, uh, cart that would haul it, and that's actually in the museum. There's a better shot of the, that, that's called the faking box, the line wound, um, and you would actually, it had to be wound by hand into this whole operation and then laid on the ground, ready to be carried by the projectile. <laughs> and that's how they kept it from snagging or you know, causing uh, difficulties. And that is the projectile, weighs about 18 pounds, and it is what that Lyle gun would fire. Um, and carrying that light line uh, that you just saw, and that uh, would then once a connection had been established between the shore and the ship, that a heavier hawser type line would be pulled out to it. And that's the line that would be used one way or another to conduct a rescue. Oh, and just to show you the lights still on at Point Betsy, I took this not too long ago. Uh, it's hard to get one when the interior is lit and the light is on and you can still see what's going on, but I like that picture. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I should say at the outset that I have long been interested in Great Lakes matters, perhaps inspired by my childhood years when my family lived on the Lake Michigan shore in Evanston, as Tim was talking about. Um, <clears throat> we lived just two blocks from Gross Point Lighthouse, a pretty prominent site, uh, partly because it uh, had a second order lens which is the largest uh, Fresnel lens used uh, in the Great Lakes. The others were uh, all in ocean coasts, and there were no first orders, the most, the largest of all in the Great Lakes. But so the one at Gross Point was one of, I think, five uh, that were assigned to major stations. In this case, it was the um, marking of Chicago. So I was just two blocks from Gross Point. Maybe I had some influence from that. I always vacationed at my, uh, my grandparents' cottage by the railroad tracks on, and uh, in, a mile out from Beulah, attended uh, services in the former congregational church, now the museum across the way, played tennis court on the tennis courts back out there. And uh, so I feel very much at home here. Um, I remember that I thought about this today that uh, the much remembered Elizabeth Case, a very important figure in this area, uh, once, pro this was probably 15 years ago, um, got talking with my wife Peggy at some art event. And at that, she, they had not met each other at that point. And um, Elizabeth said, Holly, are, are you, you have any relationship to the Hollies of Beulah and Crystal Lake? And Peggy said, well, I'm, I'm married to, to John Hawley. She said, you're married to John Hawley? He came to church every Sunday, it, brought by his grandparents, dressed in a sailor suit. She remembered that to all those years, and maybe that sailor suit had something to do with my orientation toward nautical things. I don't really know. <laughs> Excuse me. You may not know that two light stations, Gross Point and Point Betsy, share some heritage. Their identifications being both traceable to names given to their sites by early French explorers and traders hundreds of years ago. Gross Point meaning Great Point 
and Point Betsy being first known as Point Obexi derived from the name of a prevalent species of duck. Everybody knows that, I think. But each of these stations was established to mark a major shipping course, one into Chicago and the other into and through the beautiful Manitou Passage, a key waterway which offered both a welcomed refuge and sometimes life-threatening peril. My interest on Lake Michigan coastal matters grew when I was on the staff of the US House. And when Peggy and I retired year round to Frankfurt just over 20 years ago, that was when I was asked to join the newly forming board of the Friends of Point Betsy and uh, was thrilled to do so. And this was a very exciting opportunity for me, one which took me far and wide researching Point Betsy's history in preparation for the rehabilitation of the lighthouse and the depiction for our visitors of the light's 160 plus years of operation, as well as the story of the Point's former important US Life Service station. station. I was totally dedicated to the premise that we would do um, both the lighthouse and the life-saving station long uh, since uh, inoperative uh, and gone from the scene, but um, I believe that that story clearly needed to be preserved and told. So um, I decided that a book specifically about Point Betsy could and should evolve from that research. And I was able to achieve that goal in 2008. And then several years later came my brief history of Betsy Bay, which was inspired by the repurposing uh, of the former Coast Guard station as the Oliver Art Center. For this particular book, I had three objectives. I wanted to present this maritime history in a regional context, because that's the nature of the Manitou Passage, a famed sailing route extending through two adjacent counties that were originally just one, as you saw on the map. I also wanted people to know the essential federal government's vital supervisory role in the creation and operation of the passages vital navigational facilities. And lastly, I wanted to relate significant accounts of the dedicated lifesaver service as recorded in the daily reports of their officers in charge, their keepers, and to inform their commanders and in turn, the Congress and the public. To put my topic in the appropriate historical context, its roots extend back to the opening of the Erie Canal, 1824, through which thousands of migrants reached the Great Lakes, with Buffalo and Chicago in particular growing rapidly. In 1830, Buffalo was a village of about 8,000 people. Ten years later, it was a city of more than 18,000, and a decade after that, its numbers exceeded 40,000 people. Chicago's growth was similarly amazing. From just prior to the mid 19th century to 1860, just a little more than a decade, its population rose from less than 30,000 to make it the newest American city with a population over 100,000. Most of the migrants reached their homes by sailing Lake Michigan, then relied on it for both the delivery of their, the goods they needed and for marketing their products. To use a common historical maritime reference, expanding catastrophes ultimately compelled the federal government to invest resources at specific sites over many years in response to the rapidly expanding vessel traffic, crews and passengers that Western migration and settlement brought through the passage. Coastal lights to guide navigation had been the initial federal commitment in our region. First on South Manitou in 1839, Grand Traverse at the north end of the Leelanau Peninsula in 1852, Point Betsy in 1858, and on North Manitou Island in 1898, initially as a lighthouse, then as I pointed out, series of light ships, and lastly, the crib in the middle of the passage. Those light stations and their owners, I should say, and, and their um, crews 
vital to the economic and democratic growth of the region have a storied role from the earliest days until the early 18, 1980s when Point Betsy was the last manned station on Lake Michigan was automated. The federal government's involvement in, in Great Lakes lifesaving began in the early 1850s when heavy four powered metallic boats known as Francis lifeboats were delivered to various Great Lakes sites where especially needed and perhaps more importantly, could be quickly launched. These sites included the two Manitous. One of those boats was under the responsibility and care of South Island lightkeeper Alonzo Slyfield, later famous at Point Betsy, and the other under the able protection of Nicholas Picard, who sold, wook, uh, sold wood for um, the increasing steamers calling at his North Island Pier. These lifeboats could be oared to a shipwreck by six or eight very muscular recruits. Their effectiveness depended not only on the availability and willingness of reliable volunteers to leave their warm beds and or their luringly profitable fishing grounds to row over long distances in stormy seas, typical of the fall and spring. And the Manitou Islands boats, those two that I referred to, were among the better cared for during the period that those boats represented the, constituted the, the sole life-saving protection on the lakes. That was more than two decades. And, and until basically the, a new federal agency, the US Life-Saving Service emerged in the latter 1870s under the extraordinary leadership of a, Trevor, a Trevor, Treasury Department official man named Sumner Kimball the agency's first so-called general superintendent. Potential successors were likely very frustrated as he led the agency for nearly 50 years, essentially its entire history. His goals and his achievements drawing respect for our country's expanding life-saving program. He was truly a man on a mission. He skillfully fostered public interest in his team's endeavors through every opportunity to showcase its abilities, including construction of an actual life-saving station at the 1876 Centennial in Philadelphia, where a crew demonstrated its rescue techniques to very enthusiastic audiences. Kimball reported to Congress in mid-1876 that the only so-called complete life-saving stations then going into op operation on Lake Michigan were at Point Betsy and 60 miles south at Grand Point Osable. Complete meant a station with a wooden surf boat that would be rowed by six resident surfmen, steered by the keeper who would recruit and train his men. Bear in mind that the available men's prior work in these relatively isolated areas usually had been on farms or another land-based pursuits and an isolated and risky life, particularly when you're thinking of the islands, was uh, new to them. But Kimball was determined to provide such stations on the Great Lakes coast, and without which only untrained private citizens could be hoped for in terms of response to uh, an emergency. And I want to turn to illustrate that indeed heroism on the lakes began before the arrival of the US Life Saving Service. The story of the W.B. Phelps, uh, a wrecked schooner uh, about a mile east of the mainland village of Glen Arbor on the coast of Sleeping Bear Bay and that was more than two decades prior to the establishment of the Sleeping Bear Point Station, which today would be thought of, or recent, more recent times, I should say, would be thought of as responsible for that area. Heavy snow and a northwest gale the previous evening had driven the schooner aground stern first, 
as the service later described the ensuing events. Her centerboard being down broke up her deck so completely that only a small fragment of them remained on the extreme forward part of the vessel. On this fragment, hardly sufficient for a foothold, her mate and one of the sailors remained all night, the vessel being covered with ice, heeled over with her lee rail underwater, the rail upon her weather side all gone, and the sea pouring across her between the stem and stern like a cataract. It was only at daybreak that a citizen of Glen Arbor discovered two miserable survivors clinging to the bows. The alarm he gave brought to the scene a number of townspeople who sledded to the spot an old leaky flat bottom fish boat, the only craft obtainable, which was at once launched by a number of men. The, the effort these brave men made to reach the wreck was soon baffled. The terrible sea and wind driving back the boat, half filled with water and her crew drenched. Amidst the cries of the two men on the wreck for help, the boat was dragged about 20 rods to windward to get the advantage of a strong current. And the same crew made another attempt and succeeded in reaching the stern of the vessel to which they made fast by a line and surveyed the situation. The two sailors were away from them in the bows, unapproachable on the windward side of the hull by reason of the terrible sea, and inaccessible on the leeward side on account of the great mass of spars, timbers, sails, rigging, and deck plank, which hung over the whole length of the bulwarks and thrashed and bounded in the water constantly, menacing approach with destruction. The prospect of rescue was therefore gloomy, and as the boat was fast filling, it was concluded that what could possibly be done must be decided on shore, to which the crew then returned with their boat stern foremost, not daring to turn it for fear of the heavy sea. The service narrative relates that the men, soaked and covered with ice, ran to their homes to change clothes, leaving one person on the beach so the sailors on the wreck would not think that they were being abandoned. The strategy then chosen by the courageous volunteers became to try to maneuver the boat into the midst of the wreckage, which was crashing up and down, and to attempt to get the two men across it, somehow managing to avoid having their boat crushed the rescuers were able to get to within about 60 feet of the victims. They threw a line to the stranded mate who tied it around himself and used it to crawl to within 15 feet of the rescue boat and onto a piece of decking. The rescuers were then able to get close to haul him into their boat. The other man who was further weakened by his ordeal got his leg caught in the debris and was unable to free himself. One of the rescuers jumped from one piece of debris to another until he was able to grab the man by the collar and haul him onto the same decking from which he was hauled into the rescue boat. The rescuers then shoved off from the wreckage with their boat filled with water. They nonetheless managed to get to shore to the cheers of a gathered crowd. And the man is said to have shouted, thank God, I shall see my children again having been on the frigid wreck for some 20 hours, the two were taken to a hotel to recover. So that was what the rescue prospects and challenges were like prior to the arrival of the US Life Saving Service and trained crews. These were just local townspeople who rose to uh, that uh, distinction. And I should point out, out, point out that in addition to in appreciation of that his heroic achievement, the Life Saving Service awarded its prestigious gold medal to five rescuers, saying, "No man, no no man ever better deserved the token by which the nation commemorates such deeds of valor and charity." So the first U.S. Life Saving Service station, manned by a resident crew on Lake Michigan, began service 
in April of 1877 at Point Obexis, as it was then known. Its crew was called upon to respond to emergencies not only on the broad waters directly west of the station, but also to crises southward toward Frankfurt and northward toward Point Platte Bay and the southern Manitou Passage. In, and in a station opened on North Manitou um, at a later date that year, they sort of debate which came first, but I think I have it right. Uh, one came to Frankfurt uh, on the south side of the harbor, as you all probably know, uh, 1887, and uh, the stations did not come to South Manitou Island or Sleeping Bear Point until 1902. So we're talking about uh, a 25 year plus period in which these essentially oared boats and ultimately only very primitively powered boats were responsible for covering a vast amount of water. In addition to his um, recruitment responsibilities and the training of his surfmen and boat management roles, a complete station's a keeper, its commander in essence, was responsible for the maintenance of the station's entire property and equipment, for any items recovered from a wreck, and for evaluating the crew's performance in its daily drills on land and lake to raise them to the standards demanded by Superintendent Kimball and his visiting inspectors. For years, a complete station's keeper was paid $200 a year while his surfman received $40 a month during the eight months the stations on the lakes were active and so, and the men had to reside there. Hence the keeper in charge of the station made less than his men did on an annual basis. A situation about which Kimball constantly complained to Congress, campaigning for more support for his service personnel as evidenced by this appeal. Quote, heroes, heroes on 93 cents a day. That's after the men had allocated 40 cents for their board from their day's pay of $1.33. Kimball worried that, especially if they have large families to support, however full of human kindness or prone to, derrick, to daring exploits, will inevitably yield to the plump $2 or the fat $4 per diem of the lake schooner or steamer. He was afraid they were gonna lose the personnel to the commercial side. He warned, adding with the flesh pots of the cook's galley thrown in by way of garnish. The consequence is that all the best men will be drawn from the stations by the Lake Marine, forcing the employment of raw, crude, unskilled, or commonplace surfmen to fill the deserted places. You could see that Kimball and his Washington staff truly had a way with words. Incidentally, the purchasing power of $40 and $200 in the mid 1870s would today be about $1,000 or $5,100. So compensation for, uh, for both keepers and surfmen was hardly lavish. As situations, um, or at situations close to or shared with lighthouse grounds, there was another dimension to the uh, life-saving stations keepers own compensation issue, as is, as is apparent in this statement by General um, yeah, Kimball. Quote, on bad nights, the keeper, a brave, live, faithful man, is out with the patrols to make sure that there is no shirking. On him rests the unceasing care to see that the work is done, to shore up the underpaid, perhaps, in dis, perhaps disheartened men, to the nightly task of risking health, life, and limb in the watch for ships in danger. At Rex, as in a recent instance, he takes the steering oar and guides the surfboat through miles of sea, which make the boldest crew white. For all this, $400 a year. Meanwhile, 
$800 a year and two assistants at $400 each for the adjacent light keeper ensconced aloft in his solid chamber near the lens where death, when death and tempest walk the strand with the patrolman. It took unceasing appeals for years to wrest increases from Congress, first to $700 for the keeper in the mid 1870s and eventually to 1,000. Few more comments about the mandated nightly beach patrols are in order, running from 8 p.m. to midnight, midnight to 4 a.m. and 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. The men carrying a lantern and two flares, known as Costin flares for their inventor, uh, a woman and Stelly who had succeeded her husband and developed the lanterns which have ever since retained importance to the maritime community. Um, and they, these would be used to signal a ship too close to shore and thus in risk of grounding. That was the most serious and common threat to a ship's survival in our part of Michigan. Just to illustrate, but, and just, I was looking at one decade from 1893 to 1903 as an example. There were 11 recorded strandings at Sleeping Bear Point. 13 at South Manitou Island, 16 at North Manitou Island, and their total exceeded that of any other Lake Michigan site. Kimball, and, and incidentally, the map that I showed you from the Frenchman with the shallow water surrounding the mainland coast, and particularly around the islands, and leaving a navigational path in the passage at one point to less than a mile and a half wide in the era of the schooners uh, presented uh, enormous risks and challenges. Well, of those patrols, Kimball argued that owing to the patrols as well as station watch duty, and I quote him again, no man ever gets a whole night's sleep during the eight months of station duty. It hardly needs to be said how wearing such a life is to the crews. In terms that we will readily understand, given, given our ever-changing beach conditions, Kimball explained that a patrol's path, again I quote, lies along a waste of foot-detaining sand, whereon to walk is to drudge laboriously, frequently ankle deep, at times to stumble over stones or wreckage wood washed up by the sea, or to sink suddenly in spots of quicksand. Often the surf is seething across the path, or the sentinel wades knee deep into the bays beyond, or into deep cuts which trench into the sand hills. The fitful lights and shadows of a lantern alone mark the somber way. To this challenging nighttime chore must be added the typical weekly daytime ritual. Practice with the beach rescue apparatus, overhaul the gear if necessary, practice with the station's rescue craft, typically a surf boat and a larger boat, and maintain them in working order. In the later years of my period, uh, probably a motorized boat, but inevitably in those early days, they required a lot of maintenance and that could only be done by the people on site. Signal practice, practicing the resuscitation of the apparently drowned, cleaning the house and readying it for inspection. I think you get the idea of what life-saving service in the latter 19th and early 20th century involved. So let me share with you a few illustrations of my uh, text of life at the passage stations. In the fall of 1881, the Point Betsy patrolmen were searching for victims and effects of the September foundering of the Canadian steamer Columbia off Frankfurt, which had been hauling a cargo of grain from Chicago to Collingwood, Ontario, when she encountered gale force winds that caused her load to shift. Careening onto a side, she was impossible to control. Her passengers and crew got into small boats, some of which immediately swamped or capsized. Of the 23 persons aboard, 15 or 16 drowned. Interestingly, the Cleveland Herald wrote, 
The town of Frankfurt is in a state of excitement never before witnessed. Business is entirely suspended for the time being, and the beach is daily thronged with the inhabitants of the place with a view to picking up whatever wreckage of value washes ashore, and also to secure pieces of the boat for mementos of the appalling disaster. Bodies of persons who met watery graves are continually coming ashore and are picked up by men engaged to patrol the beach who bury all that are not claimed or identified. An, Ot an Ontario newspaper wrote, quote, the people of Frankfurt behaved nobly towards the survivors who were cast upon their shore naked and penniless feeding, sheltering, and clothing them without expectation of remuneration or reward. A fisherman found the wreckage over a month later when his nets fouled three miles from shore, and the Point Betsy's life-saving station keeper reported that his crew day and night would be watching for bodies and property, having learned of the disaster when they spotted portions of the ship's deck, bedding, and water casks drifting northward past his station. His crew found three bodies in their vicinity. Manitou passage keepers writings provide windows to view not only the services of their crews to Lake Michigan sailors, but also to the nature of residential life on the isolated islands and northern Lake Michigan shoreline. Here are some varied examples that reveal the surfman's values. They were truly the emergency responders of their time and place, whom injured, ill, or otherwise threatened folks called for help. In May 16, 1885, the North Manitou crew, Manitou crew was alerted by a resident to a fire in the woods about a mile from the station. The surfmen took every bucket they had, worked for six hours to, dis to extinguish the flames, extinguish the flames, saving houses and barns, a resident later noting that everything would have been swept away, but for the crew. Now their service at the residency island clearly depended upon, I mentioned in the pictures, was the mail. Weeks would sometimes pass when the famous through rain, sleet and snow tradition would be interrupted by the prohibitively dangerous lake conditions. And you can also imagine the number of times when island surfmen went into action to save the mail boat, hauling it from the mooring up onto the beach to avoid high water, and sometimes saving the occupant from stormy conditions at sea, or even an empty fuel tank or a mechanical breakdown when an offshore wind was pushing the mail boat toward the wide and dangerous open lake from which rescue was unlikely. Turning to a classic rescue account, in November 1892, the schooner Annie Vaught, carrying a load of coal from Buffalo to Milwaukee, went aground in a severe snowstorm on South Manitou Island, then being 10 years from the South Island's own life-saving station uh, was being built. The passing U.S. revenue cutter happened to be in the neighborhood, informed the North Manitou keeper whose crew loaded all the equipment for a breaches buoy rescue into their surf boat and rowed out to the cutter, which stood by. It took an hour and a half to dis disassemble the beach cart, put it into the surf boat and pull out to the cutter, which then towed the surf boat and beach apparatus to the wreck. With the lifesavers aboard, the cutter steamed to South Manitou and the apparatus was rowed to shore and ready for use. Lots of people who were trying to ride out the storm helped in this rescue effort. The cart was hauled to the wreck site over driftwood covered sand. The crew could see that the schooner was broken in two with their starboard side stove in. Members of the schooner crew were huddled together on the deck with but little protection and in grave danger of being swept off into ice cold waves. After mounting the breeches buoy apparatus on the shore, the lifesavers fired their Lyle gun toward the schooner, their first shot reaching the mast's cross trees, and saw one of the ship's crew making his way, 
try to grab the slippery line. But the huge running sea made it impossible for the crew to haul in the line, which kept drifting away. So the lifers retrieved it, did the winding in the faking box that I showed you, uh, fired again. Uh, and this one also hit its target. And a man was seen fastening the line about 20 feet up the mast. With the hawser finally connected in place, a sailor was seen to be very hesitant to get into the shorts-like breeches apparatus. So the keeper kept hollering encouragement to him. When he finally found his courage, the sailor was pulled to shore, though slackness in the hawser caused him to be repeatedly doused in the breaking waves. Reaching shore exhausted, he was given a dose of brandy by the captain of another vessel at the order of the station's keeper and taken to a fisherman's cottage to recover. Six other men and one woman were recovered in the same manner, she being assisted in reaching a house where residents would care for her. The 77-year-old schooner captain had suffered terribly in the cold and he too could not walk. The men were given brandy, apparently not the woman, at least the records don't show it. And when the last man had reached shore, he grabbed the keeper's hand and exclaimed, thank you, gentlemen, you saved my life. Unable to find dry clothes, the lifesavers still had to get their frozen rescue equipment back into their surfboat, then complete the trip to the station on the cutter and prepare for another call to duty at any time. Point Betsy's crew in 1896 was called to an interesting challenge by a station neighbor, saying his horse had fallen into a well. The crew responded it, it to his request with shovels and tackle. After much digging, they were able to rescue the valuable, but presumably petrified animal. Calls for medical assistance were not uncommon, as in 1905, when the South Island crew was asked to accompany a fish tug to Glen Haven, to bring a physician to the island. If the lifesavers would also make the trip, the doctor apparently would be assured of his safety. They did so, then returned him to the mainland after he had treated a dangerously ill woman who had given birth. In another example, an island keeper sewed up a badly cut crewman's face. Such valuable services were common. There were also numerous times in the island station's later years when a surfman performed a marine taxi service, in essence, ferrying visitors or travelers to and from lake steamers, like I showed you, who sounded their horns to signal that the seas were too dangerous or the water too shallow for them to reach their wharfs. Along with the book's chron chronologically arranged accounts of life-saving efforts of the passage crews, you should be mindful that many days also passed when there was no one to save on lake or land, only drills and other duties to perform again and again. Particularly for island crews, isolation was an ever present reality and with it came considerable boredom. I'd like to close with the story of the rescue of the steamer St. Lawrence carrying grain from Chicago to Prescott, Ontario, November of 1898. Some of you may already be familiar with it. We actually depict it at Point Betsy, but because it embodies so much of the life-saving experience, a reminder is appropriate. And it is one of the greatest rescue stories uh, from uh, Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes. The steamer had passed Frankfurt and was headed to pass Point Betsy stations and into the passage when she was pounded by some 22 inches of snow that single night and driven off course with into dreaded shallow bars about 350 yards offshore. Her captain repeatedly had ordered her whistle sounded, but since the pattern was not one of distress, the Point surfman hearing those blasts thought she was most likely coming from an Ann Arbor ferry making her way into port. But concerned that the ferry itself might have missed the harbor's narrow entry and could be driven too close to shore by the powerful wind and waves, the keeper sent his number one surfman 
down the beach, prepared to warn her off with a costume flare. The surfman traced the whistle blast as he hustled down the beach, but he couldn't see the vessel's lights on account of the heavy snowfall until he was abreast of her when he fired two costume flares. Hearing no response, he hurried back to the station to alert his crew to an apparent grounding in which the ship would be destroyed. The keeper sent a safeman to a neighboring farm to obtain a team of horses to haul the equip heavy equipment through the snow-covered beach. They, you saw the picture of men on North Manitou harness. If it was possible for them to get a horse, you know, they would take advantage of the opportunity. While his crew readied the surfboat's own wagon to be pulled to the rescue site. Upon reaching the stranded vessel, they promptly tried to go to her by boat but a breaking wave dashed their surfboat as they crossed the second bar. Returning to the beach, the keeper sent crewmen with the horses to haul the beach apparatus. Conditions were simply too dangerous to undertake a rescue by surfboat. Two cart trips were necessary on account of the storm, obstructions on the beach, and the weight of the equipment in the sand. On his second trip, the surfman stopping to light his lantern spotted a man staggering toward him, described as wet, weak, and scarcely able to stand. He feebly reported that he and others had left the steamer in her yawl, which had immediately turned turtle, and he urged the surfman to leave him and search for his shipmates. Three men were subsequently found, and after the beach apparatus was removed from the cart, it was used to transport the exhausted sailors to the station where the crew's spouses would nurse, cook, and care for them without compensation. Peggy always reminds me to add. Number one surfman soon found another man from the steamer lying on the water's edge. He dragged him higher on the beach and began resuscitation, but could see that success was not feasible. The victim bore ghastly wounds, likely having been battered to death by the overturned yawl, a victim of the mate's foolish claim on the steamer that he could reach shore in the yawl without wetting his feet. From this situation, there follows one of the most heroic rescues in Great Lakes history, beginning with the amazing, virtually blind Lyle gun shots from the beach to the stranded vessel. The lifesavers were unable to see their results through the, storm, through the snow and were retrieving the line for another when they realized that with each pull that they made, pulling it to the beach, the ship's whistle sounded. Their shot had draped across the ship's own internal whistle cord, causing the sound blast which in fact were alerting the ship that a rescue attempt was being mounted. Using that line connection, a stronger hawser was attached and sent to the vessel with the initial intention of deploying the breaches buoy to haul the wreck victims to shore. However, the conditions were then judged too dangerous for that strategy in which the writer might be frozen or drowned. The keeper settled on another tactic to bring the shipment to shore by surfboat, not by rowing to them, but by the surfman and himself going hand over hand to and from the ship, holding onto the overhead draped hawser to maintain control of their rescue boat and avoid swamping in the freezing waves. Several trips were required to ferry all the remaining still on board. This ordeal later being described by surveyors as, quote, simply one of the most heroic acts that any of them ever saw. Mindful of one sailor's death, the keeper whose boating skills were widely respected by his superiors and colleagues said, he would never understand how anyone would try to reach shore in a small boat in such conditions.
So I thank you for this wonderful opportunity to tell a bit of the story of the Manitou Passage. I think ultimately they likely were removed and returned to uh, their place of origin, which would not have been an unusual. Unless, unless there were cases of unidentification, then that would have been. In those cases, in the wreck semen, semen or not, it wasn't unusual to remove the semen. Yeah, and if they could never find any trace, they ultimately would probably be removed. Um, some stayed quite a long time to get the last part of your question first, uh, and they worked their way up. Uh, I alluded a couple of times to the number one. He would be the person who was the keeper's right-hand man. He would take over the keeper's responsibilities if something happened to me. But all of them, then, all of the serpent were known by the number, one through six, and then ultimately one through seven, when the service finally prevailed on Congress to give them enough money so that they could leave one person in the station when six of them went off in a boat. And that person knew something about where they were going and what game was important. Kind of the man. Um, but realistically, uh, as I said at the outset, these were isolated stations in the time frame we're talking about. So there weren't a whole lot of uh, opportunity. They would. Um, even advertised that there were opportunities for safety, for safety, but they were required to pass certain basic tests. There were criteria that were set up by the federal agency uh, that had to be faithfully fulfilled by the keeper. And uh, they had to go through all the training that the keeper was responsible for doing. And um, they say some managed to stay and they worked their way up to maybe be the, maybe someday be the number one. Uh, but I think the service of several years was probably more typical. And, um, the compensation was so low, and it took so long to do something like that. Um, The year 1915, which is where my book ends. Yeah, so I had to pick an end date. If I went and started into the Coast Guard, there wasn't going to be a way I was going to have an end. Uh, so I, I wanted to focus on what was the predecessor and uh, of the life saving service and the legacy that it left. This was a rugged transition, um, particularly the people who had served in the U.S. Life Saving Service for a substantial period, particularly the keepers who had the greatest reason for being there, responsible for their stations. They, they were not thrilled at the demise of the agency and uh, being absorbed into what was then being created. Those kind of and, um, and there were inequities. I, mean, I can tell you, I mean, the most famous example that I can think of is a man who was uh, the keeper at Point Betsy, uh, but also served earlier out on uh, Beaver Island. It was both a light keeper out there and then later ran the Beaver, Beaver Island life saving station. 
he spent over 40 years working in what was basically federal employment, remember? And he was still living, living in Frankfurt in his 90s, mowing lawns for a living. Because up until about the time that the, that the Coast Guard was established, and not, not immediately even then, uh, there were no retirement benefits from the life saving service. Five, and, and even for the beginnings of the Coast Guard. Finally, when that was secured, they did not go back and treat as eligible the people who, in fact, back then had met the requirements that the law provided that you had to meet in order to be eligible. So you never got those after 40 some years of work. Cause. Well, You've been a great audience, and I appreciate your patience and your interest. And I hope to uh, understand what a great heritage we have here. I wanted to say uh, one other thing, and that is that uh, I was uh, grateful for the support of the uh, Leon uh, Historical Museum for many of the pictures that I showed you. Uh, of that particular area. Just as I am very grateful to our historical society, for not only for providing this forum tonight, but for the great collections that it has. And in both cases, there are marvelous exhibits and so forth. That have, these, these things have come a long way in recent years. And uh, they uh, are preserving and presenting past, a subject which I think is enormously important. So thank you.